November 1922, the tomb of Pharaoh Tutankhamun was discovered in Egypt. Western Egyptologists have been fruitlessly trying to find it for many years. It would be opened gradually, chamber by chamber, and each step of the British researchers would be rewarded with priceless archaeological treasures. The burial chamber of Tutankhamun would be reached only on February 1923. So far, this has been the greatest discovery in the history of Egyptology. And to this day, the story thrills the minds and hearts of people. Because after the tomb was open, some strange and frightening things happened. Something that could not be hidden. Because the living can pretend to be dead. But the dead can't pretend to be alive. On April 5th, 1923, George Herbert, the 5th Earl of Carnarvon, the initiator and sponsor of the expedition, died a strange death. He had lived only four months after personally visiting the tomb. This was only the first incident in a series of strange deaths that scared the hell out of many who had any relation to ancient Egyptian relics. That's when people started talking about the curse of the pharaoh. Today, you're going to find out. Was there really a curse and what exactly did it say? Why couldn't thieves loot the tomb for thousands of years? And what caused the death of the members of the expedition that opened Tutankhamun's tomb? What killed the scientists in the tomb of Tutankhamun? Like this video and subscribe to our channel. This will show YouTube the content you like and you'll see more interesting and thrilling videos in your recommendations. Let's start straight away with those strange deaths. Who exactly died and more importantly, when and how? We'll return to the already mentioned death of Lord Carnarvon a little further on. It is probably the strangest one in a series. But apart from that, there are several other incidents connected with that ominous tomb. On May 16, 1923, the American financier George Gould died. He too was incautious enough to visit the tomb. On September 26, 1923, a half-brother of Carnarvon, traveler and diplomat Colonel Aubrey Herbert died. Apparently, Tutankhamun doesn't even spare the close relatives of the desecrators of his tomb. On July the 10th, 1923, a member of the Egyptian royal family, Prince Ali Kamel Fame Bey, who was present at the opening of the tomb, perished. Coincidence? On January the 15th, 1924, Sir Archibald Douglas Reed died. He was taking pictures of the pharaoh's mummy. Apparently, Tutankhamun didn't like to be photographed either. On April 6th, 1928, one of the key members of the expedition, archaeologist Arthur Mays, passed away. On May the 26th, 1929, Marvin Herbert, another younger half-brother of Lord Carnarvon, died. Does Tutankhamun continue to take revenge on his main offender? That is not an exhaustive list. More people would die next. All of them were involved in the opening of this gruesome tomb. At some point, it's going to seem like there's no end to this terrible story. And to sort it out, we'll have to go back to the beginning. Egyptian civilization is so ancient that it is difficult to imagine this ancientness correctly. In one of our previous videos about the Pyramids of Giza, we explained it with an illustrative example with the last queen of Egypt, Cleopatra, who ruled 51 to 30 years BC. We explained that for Cleopatra, the pyramids of Giza were even more ancient than Cleopatra is for us now. Imagine a timeline. On the left is the time of construction of the Pyramid of Cheops, about 2500 BC. On the right is our time. Here is where our era began, the worldwide accepted timeline from Christ's birth. And here is when Herodotus, who is called the father of history, was born. Yes, it is believed that history as a science began with him. And this is when Tutankhamun was born. Do you see the point? Even to the father of history, the ancient Greek who lived in the immensely distant past, even for him the Egyptian rulers were something incredibly ancient, wrapped in mystery. 
And on top of that, consider the strangeness and the uniqueness of ancient Egyptian artifacts, which were purposefully searched for and found by the adventurers of all stripes throughout the centuries. After all, Egypt was very different from the rest of the ancient world because of its pantheon of fantastic deities, half animal, half human, its rulers who were regarded as gods on earth, its bizarre funeral rites, which paid extraordinary attention to preparation for the afterlife, and its mysterious scripts, which were written in recognizable pictures but long remained unreadable and therefore puzzling for lay public. Egypt succeeded in inspiring awe and even fear in strangers who came into contact with its culture long before it became mainstream. The fascination with ancient Egypt and attributing mystical things to it started a long time ago when there was no mass media in the form we know it today. And now, can you imagine what began in the mass media of the 1920s after the discovery of the most sensational find in the history of Egyptology? But where did the newspapers get reliable information from? Well, probably from the source that is, from Lord Carnarvon himself and members of the research group. But that's exactly the point where difficulties arose almost immediately. Lord Carnarvon was a wealthy man, but Tutankhamun's tomb was such a large scale in science-intensive discovery that it took many years and a fortune to do all the work to study it. And indeed, the last funerary accessories were mothballed and sent to Cairo as late as 1932. Carnavaran's decision solved a number of issues at once, such as financing and problems with the annoying press. Without thinking twice, he simply sold the Times exclusive rights to publish anything about the tomb, naturally for an impressive amount of money. By doing so, he was able not only to offset the expenses for previous and future work on the site, but also to avoid the prying eyes of journalists. And there were good reasons for this, because the media had been a real pain in the neck to Carnarvon and his team of archaeologists in the past. The fact is that work on the search for Tutankhamun's tomb had been started six years earlier, and throughout this time reporters drove the members of the expedition to complete exhaustion. Now they no longer had direct access to them. That didn't mean, of course, that the Times were hiding anything. Indeed, the newspaper published detailed reports but other newspapers could not write anything credible until at least one day after the Times. Needless to say, the other newspapers were extremely unhappy with this state of affairs and tried to get information in any way they could. Carnarvon and expedition leader Carter made things even worse when they forbade virtually everyone, except a few select people, from participating in the excavation. It was extremely difficult for other Egyptologists and even very influential people to gain access to the tomb. Such secretiveness gave rise to more and more rumors, more and more speculation. The newspapers multiplied and exaggerated it all for better sales. This is how it may have remained within the realm of implausible legends. But on May the 6th, 1923, Lord Carnarvon died just four months after the tomb was discovered. Needless to say that his death was quickly linked to Tutankhamun in the grandest mystical manner so beloved of the press at the time. We'll soon tell you what was going on around this event and, believe me, the story is going to amuse you. But first, let's make a little bit of an unexpected move and take a closer look at almost to the present day when scientists have come close to guessing the real causes of Carnarvon's death. Don't worry, there'll be no spoilers. Many years after the death of George Herbert Carnarvon in the 1980s, a version began to gain ground that the cause was, after all, you won't believe it, Tutankhamun but not in such a gruesome form as fantasized by the sensitive people. Some researchers hypothesize that the tomb may have retained microorganisms to which the tomb discoverers were vulnerable. They say we should look in that direction. Pretty quickly, the theory began to take specific shape. The idea that the invisible killer was a toxic fungus got the most points from scientists. The issue of Philadelphia Inquirer dated July 30th, 1985, contained the article, Thesis, Fungi, not a curse, killed the finders of King Tut's tomb. 
Specifically, scientists conclude that the most likely killer is the fungus Aspergillus flavus. The Proceedings of the Royal Society publishes the results of the research by Dr. Sylvian Gandon, where he discusses the longevity of fungi and the strength of toxic effects on their spores. He's backed up by archaeologist Nicholas Reeves, who also speaks of some black fungus inside the tomb. Interestingly, the version was not only well-founded, but also very reasonable. Indeed, it had indirect but serious and proven supporting evidence from the not-too-distant past. In 1973, there was a terrible story of the opening of the tomb of King Casimir IV, Jagiello of Poland, in the city of Krakow. Terrible because the discoverers there began to die one by one, too. Naturally, there immediately appeared a legend about Jagiellonian curse. But soon, microbiologist Bessel or Smake identified the fateful fungus Aspelagus flavus in the samples taken from the tomb. This type of fungus produces very harmful substances, aflatoxins. They've been attributed to a number of serious diseases that affect the liver, and they're also highly carcinogenic. It would seem that everything fits. Why make up something else if the version is so plausible? And why guess when you can run tests? And of course, the tests were done, and the toxic fungus was found on many of the mummies. It's just a very fertile environment for it. But the question has not been solved, and the scientific debate continues, because some studies refute others. For example, a publication in The Lancet, dated September 6, 2003, provides some interesting details. On March 17, 1923, the Times reported that Lord Carnarvon suffered from pain as the inflammation affected the nasal passages and eyes. And this, according to the author of the study, is consistent with invasive aspergillosis sinusitis, with localized spread to the eye socket. So, was it fungus after all? Well, it's not that clear-cut. It's more like no. Further research disproves it. The most likely and generally accepted version of Lord Carnarvon's death will be revealed at the end of the video. So watch it to the end. And we're going to go back to the time of the excavation because we have to sort out the other deaths and clarify the thing with the curse of Tutankhamun, surrounded by so much hype. And there was a lot of hype because the early death of the main and noble person Carnarvon stirred up the public and the press. Quite quickly, the hypotheses of the Pharaoh's curse appeared and began to gain momentum. There were numerous versions of the specific text of the curse to which the death of the noble British aristocrat could be imputed. Most tried to link it to the warning inscription in the tomb. Some reporters were aided by disgruntled Egyptologists who were denied not only access to the tomb, but also any information about it. A wide variety of interpretations of the inscriptions in Tutankhamun's tomb emerged. Newspapers added their misinterpretations and twists, which our generation would call clickbait. Here, for example, Egyptologist David P. Silverman shared a funny story from those years. A harmless text inscribed on the clay plaster in front of the sanctuary of Anubis in the treasure chamber read, I am the one who prevents the sand from blocking the secret chamber. In the newspaper, it was transformed into, I will kill all of those who cross this threshold into the sacred precincts of the royal king who lives forever. What an author's interpretation. Such twists spread quickly, and soon curses were found in all inscriptions, even where there were none. Since few people could read the hieroglyphics and thus check the original, reporters were able to avoid claims and revelations easily and for a long time. For example, they published a photograph of a large golden shrine in the burial chamber along with a translation of the accompanying inscription. They who enter this sacred tomb shall swift be visited by wings of death. It was this phrase that went viral as the curse of Tutankhamun. But what was it in reality? And in fact, the texts on this shrine are taken from the Book of the Dead, a collection of spells meant to ensure the eternal afterlife, not to interrupt the earthly one. David P. Silverman wrote bitterly back in 1987. 
Poor Lord Carnarvon, his death, rather than promoting the peace and quiet that he'd wished for himself and his colleague Howard Carter, resulted in more interest in and scandal and intrigue about the discoverers of King Toot. Indeed, a real craze soon began. Newspapers around the world published an article about Lord Carnarvon's death from mysterious and sinister forces breaking loose from the tomb he was responsible for opening. Various related phenomena were also attributed to the effect of the curse on the desecrator of the tomb. For example, it was reported that all of the lights in Cairo went out precisely at the moment of Lord Carnarvon's death. Power outages in Cairo, however, were not uncommon, and most tourists visiting Egypt experienced them more than once. Carnarvon's son, Lord Porchester, further enhanced the mystery by revealing that his father's dog, at home in the family Highclere Castle, let out a wailing cry at the moment of its owner's death, and then died as well. Lord Porchester, however, according to numerous evidence, was in India at the time of his father's death. Therefore, the story of the dog's death was surely nothing more than a fabrication and not an unselfish one. The fact is that the estate of the late Lord Carnarvon continued to benefit from an agreement signed with the Times, receiving a percentage of the profits from selling the stories. Keeping the public interest high was a lucrative business for both the Times and Carnarvon's estate. All right, you might say, but the story started out as not just a single death, but a chain of strange and confusing tragic events. Yes, that is right. And now we're going to give you the definitive answers, at least the ones that modern science has. We bet you didn't see the catch at the beginning of the video when we were enumerating the departed people. And the catch was that we didn't mention the causes of their deaths, direct causes. And if we do, there will be fewer questions and mysteries much fewer. Let's do it. The financier George Gould, he was one of the first to die. Of what? Of a paracute pneumonia coupled with a fever contracted in Egypt. Lord Carnarvon's brother, Colonel Aubrey Herbert. The cause of his death was blood poisoning. Could he have caught it from a mummy? No, a simple botched dental operation. Sir Archibald Douglas Reed, the one who photographed the pharaoh's mummy, his disease was said to be very mysterious at the time, but he was a radiologist and he died merely from the effects of multiple radiation exposures. People didn't really know to be careful with x-rays back then. Lord Carnarvon's half-brother, Marvin Herbert, died from pneumonia affected by malaria. Arthur Mace, archaeologist, died of pneumonia too. <laughs> coincidence, yeah, coincidence because Mace was already in poor physical condition, suffering from pleurisy even before the tomb was discovered, which is why he had to leave Carter's team in the middle of the inventory of the tomb. And the cherry on top, Prince Ali Kamel Fameh Bey, the only one of them all to die a violent death. But he wasn't strangled by a mummy or scared to death by its ghost. He was shot by his own wife, Marguerite Alibert, during a heated argument. And what did Lord Carnarvon himself die of? His death was strange and even ridiculous, but it was not mystical at all. There is no absolute certainty, but a credible medical version says that he died of blood poisoning. First, he was bitten by a mosquito, and then, while he was shaving, he accidentally cut the bite. An infection got into the wound, which led to severe complications and sad consequences. The version of such a ridiculous death, however, didn't suit journalists and many famous personalities. It was much more interesting to propagate the idea of a curse. Even Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, expressing his personal opinion on the existence of a curse, suggested that Lord Carnarvon's death was caused by some elementals created by the priests of Tutankhamun to guard the royal tomb. The most important thing is somehow overlooked by the followers of the curse theory. What happened to the rest of the expedition? Did they die too? Yes, they did, each and every, but from old age and of natural biological causes. Howard Carter, who, it would seem, should have been the first to fall victim to the curse, died 16 years after the tomb was opened in 1939, aged 64. Carnarvon's daughter, Lady Evelyn, despite being one of the first to descend to the tomb and being present when the sarcophagus was opened, lived happily 
for 79 years. Her elder brother and Carnarvon's only son, Henry, lived peacefully for 89 years. Both had children. Lord Carnarvon's descendants in the male and female lines are still living and at present their lineage has not been continued and the family title has not been lost. It seems they all managed to make some sort of arrangement with Tutankhamun. Epilogue. But there was one most crucial oddity left in this whole story. How come all those treasures in the tomb had remained untouched for so many thousands of years? After all, we know that every single tomb in the Valley of the Kings was looted long ago, back in prehistoric times. Maybe, despite all the rational explanation and the scientific skepticism, there were still some unknown forces guarding Tutankhamun's peace and keeping the vandals away. In fact, things are quite prosaic here too, but interesting. It is known that the tomb was broken into as many as two times, almost certainly with the intention of stealing valuables. We don't know who these people were, but we can speculate. In fact, Carter himself, the leader of the expedition, made such assumptions. And he did it for a reason, and on the basis of evidence. Yes, that's right. There were things found in the tomb that could be considered actual crime scene evidence. Who would have thought that Tutankhamun's tomb would provide work not only for archaeologists, but also for criminologists, in a figurative sense, but still? First of all, the tomb was definitely opened after it was sealed, and it was even opened twice. You may ask, how could it have been done twice? Isn't one time enough? The point is, it was opened and sealed back up, like they were covering their tracks. But that's not enough to suggest trespassing. Maybe the priests decided to bring some extra useful stuff that the pharaoh would need in the afterlife. But no. In his book, Howard Carter says that among the many things found in the tomb, something strange was discovered. A somewhat untidy-looking, scarf-like shawl, and it had massive golden bracelets and heavy gold rings wrapped in it. But why was this wrapping left in the tomb? It's unlikely that the thieves simply lost it. As Carter suggests, and many other Egyptologists agree, the thieves were simply caught red-handed. The tomb was then quickly and rather carelessly sealed, obviously, in a hurry. Who were these people? Who were the thieves and those who covered their tracks? We don't know. Maybe they were less religious participants of the burial ceremony. Or maybe they were light-fingered guards. But it doesn't matter, and here is why. The pharaoh had no heirs. Apparently, his wife twice gave birth to daughters who died instantly or were even born dead. So the unfortunate Tutankhamun was quickly forgotten, and then his tomb was forgotten. Sick transit, Gloria Mundi. Thus passes the worldly glory.